Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And I'm Lauren Gorn. And today we're getting enthusiastic about aspect. But first, our most recent bonus episode was about comparatives and superlatives. Would you say that it's a good episode? It's definitely one of our better episodes on this topic. In fact, it's the first time we've done an episode on superlatives, so it's the best. It's the only time, so we've made sure that it's superlative in the linguistic and non-linguistic sense. To listen to the comparative and superlatives episode and over seven years of monthly bonus episodes, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm. One of my favorite linguistic craft projects was when I embroidered the International Phonetic Alphabet. I remember that project! You put photos of it on your blog. Mm -hmm. I love it when people make linguistics crafts and share photos of them or bring them to conferences. It's so much fun. Yeah, I had already embroidered the IPA when we started this podcast. And while I was embroidering the IPA, I really enjoyed thinking about each of the sounds while I was embroidering it. And then Since I embroidered the IPA all in a single weekend, it was sort of an impulse project. When I got back to campus that week, I showed it to all my linguistics friends, and they thought it was cool. Aw. So in addition to this charming linguistics crafts anecdote, you've also just talked about embroidering the International Phonetic Alphabet in a couple of different grammatical ways. You've said, while I was embroidering the IPA, and then also since I embroidered the IPA all in a single weekend. So now both of those actions take place in the past. You have definitely finished embroidering the IPA by now. It's been years. But there are different ways of considering what the shape of this same embroider action looks like. So I was embroidering the IPA. We're considering this event as sort of a large blob in which other events can take place like thinking about each of the sounds as you're embroidering them. Or I was embroidering the IPA and chatting to my sister. I was embroidering the IPA in the evenings when I had free time. Exactly. All of these are blobby sorts of events. But I embroidered the IPA. Now we're considering this event like a little dot or a point or an X that happens at a point in time, and we're not looking at the inside of it. It's done, it's over, it's one thing that happened. I embroidered the IPA since it was a long weekend. I embroidered the IPA, and then I got it framed. Two different points of events happening in a sequence. These are all things that happened in the past, but we can consider them in different ways. Right. We're using an ing suffix for embroidering in contrast to an ed suffix embroidered. With the ing, we're thinking about events differently in terms of how they're shaped. We're sort of zooming in on them differently. So if we were putting these events on a timeline from past to present to future, all of these events would take place in the same location in the past. So the difference between these isn't about tense, because tense is about where things are on the timeline. We need a new word to describe how things are shaped on the timeline, what the shape of those events are, what they look like. I'm very tempted to come up with a fun or easy to remember word like shapitude or howness or look likery. Or time activity like time relativity? Oh, I think the physicist might take issue with that. Mm. And also, time activity sort of sounds like a fancy word for tense. And tense is more about where we're looking for something that's like what they look like. The term that English and many other languages use is aspect. So in addition to this grammatical sense, aspect also gets used in a relatively vague way as a general English word. Like you might say, I'm looking at all aspects of the situation. It is vague to the point of unhelpfulness in its general use. (laughs) It sure is. But aspect as a phenomenon is really cool. And if we go back to the etymology, we can get a sense of what the original metaphor was that the grammarians are trying to cue us into when we talk about aspect. So aspect comes from Latin aspectus, which is a seeing or a looking at or a sight. Okay. It's the same spec root as in spectacles ah. or inspect hmm. plus 
ad as a prefix, which means to or at. So we're sort of looking at things, putting on our aspect spectacles, if you like. I love that it comes from a late 14th century astrological term, mm. which is when people were looking at the planets as they appear from Earth. So they were making sense of the shape of the night sky. I like it. So look likery wasn't that far off, I will say. And thinking about the shape of events is kind of how they borrowed that metaphor. I like it. So now that we have our aspect spectacles on so we can see all the little shapes, and we're paying attention to the shape of events, mm -hmm. let's look at some examples. Great. Let's start with an aspect where there's a focus on the ongoing shape of an event. Something like, I am embroidering. I am in the process of doing that. The event is like a blob or lots of little dots. The embroidery was a cross stitch. Nice. So maybe it's lots of little cross stitch dots or a cloud over a specific part of the timeline. So this type of aspect is something that continues. So it's sometimes called a continuous aspect. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people also call it a progressive aspect because the it refers to an event that's in progress. Mm. We're going to hopefully stick with continuous here. And English uses this sort of was Xing to to do the the continuous aspect. But another really popular strategy in several of the world's languages is to repeat some aspect of the verb because this helps emphasize that it's it's ongoing, there's lots of little dots, or it's it's taking place over a span of time. Yeah, so this repetition or reduplication is in a language called Mokalese, which is one of the languages of Micronesia. And there's a example that I think is really charming. You have the phrase to gather stones, which is rik sakai. Mm -hmm. And then if you are to be gathering stones is rik rik sakai. Okay, so rik becomes rik rik. It's just more repeated. Yep. And then to continue gathering stones, really emphasizing that continuous nature of the event is rik 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 sakai. Brilliant. Perfect. No notes. So yep. understandable. So satisfying. Very satisfying from rik to rik rik to rik rik rik. Languages don't generally count beyond three, so but maybe someone might jocularly just keep going if they wanted to be in very emphatic. Example. Who knows? It's very elegant. Exactly. In the paper that we have, there's it, it goes up to three. But this is this is found around the world, right? Yeah. So I have another example from Straight Salish, which I believe is over in the North American part of the world where you are, Gretchen. Yeah, that's a it should be a language of British Columbia. There's actually several varieties of Straight Salish that I'm aware of, so I'm not sure which one it is. This paper's from nineteen ninety six and doesn't specify. Ah, okay, well there you go. But there's a Really nice example here that shows how this repetition when it comes to verbs emphasizes an ongoing nature of an event. But sometimes if you used repetition with other parts of the grammar, it can be more like a plural or more than one person or thing. Ah. And in this example, the verb to dive is nakung. But if you have nuck nucking with that repetition, you have something that can mean to dive repeatedly, or maybe you have something that means many people diving, or many people dive repeatedly. So you get both that plural and that continuous as possible readings. That's really nice. Yeah. Uh, this reminds me of a thing that's in ASL mm -hmm. where you can repeat certain signs to make them plural either as nouns or make the actions more plural or more continuous if they're verbs. Cool. So the sign for child, for example, if you want to make it children, you repeat the sign sort of over a space. So that's a noun. And whereas the sign for eat, if you want to say eat a lot or sort of eat continuously, you can also repeat the sign for eat with both hands and, and express that. We've got videos of the, of the signs which we'll link to. Great. So again, repetition is creating the sense of continuous or ongoing element and creating that aspectual shape to what people are communicating. Yeah, there's actually lots of aspects that have been described, at least for ASL in particular, and I wouldn't be surprised if for some other sign languages. Mm -hmm. There's this book from 1979, The Signs of Language by Edward Klima and Ursula Bellucci, which has all these diagrams showing different kinds of aspects that signs can have. So they have the sign for sick in the sort of base form, which involves, you know, one hand at the forehead and one hand at the stomach. And then 
if you want to express being sick continuously, you can make those hands draw circles in several different ways to express different types of continuing. Mm, charming example sentence there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, not very fun to think about being sick all the time. You know, it's very important to describe how long exactly you're feeling sick for. We can kind of do this repetition in English as well. I wouldn't say it's particularly standard, but you know, if you say, I'm going to dance, dance, dance all night, or I'm going to sleep as long as I can. They both add a kind of durational continuing element to it, but definitely not. We don't have as many resources as signed languages do for using space to represent the shape of an event. Yeah. And it is, I was going to say it's not quite as grammaticalized to say like, there was so much food at the party, we just ate and ate and ate. But I've noticed that there's, we often use it three times there. Mm -hmm. Like, all I want to do is dance, dance somehow is not as grammatical as all I want to do is dance, dance, dance. Like, it really wants to be three times. Hmm. So that's an interesting level of grammaticalization, even in this sort of straight-up repetition thing that we do in English sometimes. I think part of why we use repetition in informal English is because our continuous is, uh, I think it's fair to say, a little bit odd. <laughs> yeah, it's – historically, it's got a whole story. <laughs> yeah. So – in the past and in the future, we can talk about I was hiking or I will be hiking. And these are both these nice sort of like was Xing, will be Xing, these nice continuous forms <laughs> yeah. that are relatively straightforward. But then when it comes to the present, if I say I am hiking, yeah. that could mean that this event is sort of ongoing um, and takes place over a span of time. But it is also just the way to say it's happening now. Yeah. And like I can say I hiked last weekend and that's like the simple past to mean, yeah, it happened at a point in time last weekend. But if I say I hike right now to mean, you know, hello, I hike. I'm on a hike right now. I hike. <laughs> if you just say I hike, it just sounds like it's a hobby you have. Right. Like I hike. I'm a hiker. I go hike on weekends. I don't. But some people do. I'm very happy for them. <laughs> and this didn't used to be the case in English because you get like Shakespeare examples mm -hmm. where people will say things like, I go, my lord. Or Hamlet says memorably, oh, I die, Horatio. Yeah. when I mean, partly because you said low, but also when you were making a joke about like, I hike, I was like, oh, it sounds very... Shakespearean, because that's literally the structure in Shakespeare. I don't think Shakespeare went on a lot of hikes. You know, if he if he did, please uh, tell him to write in for me on the grave. <laughs> but these days, Hamlet would have to say something like, I'm going, I'm going, my lord, or I'm dying, Horatio. But he doesn't. He says, I go, I die. I can't just like text you a selfie from the trail being like, lo, I hike. Mm -hmm. Here's a photo of me doing it. <laughs> <laughs> if you say something like, I hike, the implication is... Like, it's a hobby I have on weekends. Mm -hmm. And because if someone says, I hike, there's an assumption that they go out regularly and they have a habit of going hiking. That's actually an aspect type that we call the habitual. Ah, it's a habit. Mm -hmm. Or like, I walk my dog every night, I brush my teeth regularly, you know, all these sorts of things you can do as a habit. Yeah. But those are boring habits. I have a good habit. Okay. Let's hear about your habits. Well, okay. I don't personally indulge in this habit. You'll see why. Okay. I recently learned a thing about Bletchley Park. Yeah. So you know that place in the UK where they had all the code breakers during World War II? Mm -hmm. And apparently sometimes they'd be like wandering around the grounds by the lake with a nice cup of tea, pondering codes and breaking them. And they'd get a flash of insight and they'd just throw their teacup into the lake. Okay. I have some questions and most of them are about aspect. But <laughs> right? when you say that, were they just like throwing teacups into the lake like every time they had an insight? <laughs> Are there like hundreds and hundreds of teacups at the bottom of the lake at Bletchley Park right now? So it depends on who you ask. Right. Because – this story has sort of taken hold in the popular imagination that it's got this kind of habitual aspect of like maybe an iterative aspect. They're just throwing teacups over and over the lake on many occasions. There's this story from Atlas Obscura that sort of links the yeah. memo that like, hey, guys, you need to bring your teacups back because we don't have enough to serve tea with, with they found teacups in the lake. And like, maybe they're just throwing teacups in the lake like regularly, habitually, all the time. Right. <laughs> At least once a day, the whole war. <laughs> so I think this is a nice example of how something that is just a general continuous would be 
there's a crate of teacups and someone spending a half an hour nonstop throwing them into the lake for reasons I can't personally fathom <laughs> versus a habitual, which is just like every time I walk past the lake with a teacup, I chuck it in. <laughs> It's a very important aspectual distinction. But even that habitual story, much as it seems modestly more plausible, mm -hmm. does seem to be an exaggeration. So the official Bletchley account has a story of one guy, one time, who threw a cup, and it was actually coffee, into the lake. <laughs> Okay, so we're not applying any kind of continuous or habitual aspect to this event. It was one time. This is a punctative event. It just happened <laughs> one time. <laughs> but it is fun to contemplate in its continuous, like, repetitive teacup chucking imagery, if nothing else. The continuous and the habitual both involve kind of an extended period of time that events are taking place in. It's just that the shape is a bit different. With continuous, you have this long duration of time, whereas the habitual or some kind of iteration where you just have these little regular punctual spots across a period of time. In English, both of those are aspects where there may not be a specific grammatical marking for them that distinguishes them from other things, which is why you have to check if something is happening regularly or habitually. If throwing teacups in the lake is happening regularly or habitually. <laughs> but that's not the case for all languages. So with Hindi, there is a grammatical habitual. The example I have slightly morbidly is like Hamlet, to die. So the Hindi for die is marna. Uh -huh. And then to habitually die, I don't know how one elicits that context, is marta hona. So there's a different grammatical structure that shows you it's habitual. I guess handy if you play video games. Maybe if you're playing Hamlet in a play every night for a month, you could be habitually dying every night. Oh, yep, yeah, true. And this is what's interesting about the way English does aspect in the present, that our simple present, like I go to the theatre, mm -hmm. actually implies I attend regularly. Yes. Whereas... I'm going to the theater means like I'm going tonight. Yeah. So this is part of the challenge of aspect because there isn't like one standard set of here are all the aspects or here are all the aspect markers that are the same across languages. Languages have different aspects that they care about marking grammatically. And they also have historic processes where the aspectual connotations of particular forms can change. Like with this, the English simplest form of the present verb actually has this not quite as simple habitual meaning some, but not all of the time. <laughs> and I think this is a real difference with tense where all humans are bound by the same linear time. And so you have some way of distinguishing some amount of past and future and present across languages. Whereas when it comes to aspect, there's just so many different shapes that events can take. You do get common categories like habitual or continuous, but there's also a lot more variation. And to make this even more fun in English, mm -hmm. this thing that I said about how the simple present has this habitual meaning, yes. that's only true for like typical action verbs, something like hike or go. Yeah. Because for verbs – that have to do with mental states, like I know, or I think, or I feel, yeah. we don't go around saying I'm knowing the answer, hmm. unless you really want to emphasize the continuousness. By default, we say I know the answer still, which is like a relic of this older system. I would say I feel delighted by that example rather than I am feeling delighted by that example. That's true. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that before. Yeah, you could say it in some context, but like the default way – for verbs of like psychological experience is still to use the simple present, but not for verbs of like actions. <laughs> mm -hmm. We have this whole distinction going on that English speakers mostly just do instinctively, but if you're trying to learn English, this can be a real sticking point. And conversely, if you're an English speaker, you need to unlearn reaching for this distinction if you're learning another language, probably, because this is a fairly typologically uncommon thing to do. I also really appreciate that African American English has solved habitual constructions in a completely different way to standard English as well, by using a completely different construction to flag when something is habitual. So this is the habitual B, which is an invariant form of B, as in 
she be telling people she was seven. A lot of kids like going around informing people of their ages. And this is this habitual, like, Mm -hmm. repeated action. This kid is doing this a lot. Or I be in my office by 8.30. This is a habitual action. I might not be there on time today, but normally I am. And these examples are from Lisa Green's book on African-American English. But if we just had an African-American English speaker tell the story of if he was throwing teacups in the lake or he be throwing teacups in the lake, we would know instinctively if this was a story about a one-time event or a repeated event. This would be very handy. We've talked about a lot of these different fine-grained distinctions that languages may or may not make about habitual or continuous and how some languages care more or less about encoding them specifically in the grammar. Are there any generalizations we can say about how lots of languages do aspect? I think the biggest aspect distinction you tend to find across languages is a difference between whether an event was completed or not completed and paying attention to that part of the shape of an event. We have a World Atlas of Linguistic Structures survey to draw on very conveniently. Mm -hmm. And almost half of the languages in that survey of 220 languages have some kind of marking on the grammar for whether something is completed or not as a major distinction. That seems sort of useful to be able to talk about. Yeah. And it has some really interesting implications. So, for example, one of the language examples they have on the World Atlas of Linguistic Structures is from Rendile, which is an East Cushitic language of Kenya. Mm -hmm. And in this language, the verb write has two different endings depending on whether the event is completed or not. So, we have a form chirte with an e at the end for a completed event for the verb write. So, if he wrote letters it would have this chirte with the e because the event is completed. It it has this implication that's already done. So he wrote letters. You translate it with the past in English. Right. So this is where sometimes aspects and tenses start overlapping a little bit. But the Mm -hmm. looking at the the contrasting form is really what illustrates that this isn't a tense. This is about whether it's completed or not. Yeah. So if we have chirta with an a at the end, that is... He writes letters, he is writing letters, he was writing, he will write letters, with no indicator of whether that event has been completed or will be completed. Right. Okay. So one of them is like the letter writing happened, definitely definitely what took place or was was completed, was finished. Yeah. And the other one is like letter writing at some point. Letter writing happening and completion has not occurred. Yeah. And so this kind of distinction interacts with tense because we exist in time. If, if an action is completed, it has to have already happened. <laughs> yeah. And this kind of marking crops up across language families as a, a major distinction, focusing on whether events are completed or not as a major aspectual distinction. And this is a fairly intuitive distinction for me that has a name that I found confusing when I first learned it, Uh (laughs) which is that the completed events are called perfective and the incomplete events are called imperfective. Yes. And I don't want to be like, oh, the letters, they're done. They were so perfect. (laughs) It's not that meaning of perfect. It's another meaning of perfect. It's the perfect that you get in something like perfect stranger. Oh. As in complete stranger, completed event. Perfect stranger, perfective event. So a perfect stranger is not a stranger who's like the ideal version of a stranger. I mean, it is in a really bad dating show from the 80s. <laughs> but it is a stranger that's like a complete stranger. And the word perfect comes from the French word and ultimately from the Latin word that means completed or accomplished yeah. because it's like the past form of the word to make or to do. Yeah. So it is actually... Etymologically very nice, but we don't all know Latin, so there we are. And as we said, it's a form of perfect that gets used in these like relic phrases now, rather than Mm. the sense we immediately think about. So imperfective, perfective is about an incomplete or a complete event. And some of the categories that we've always looked into, like continuous and habitual, these are types of imperfective, because if something is still ongoing, or if it's repeated over and over again, or it's a habit, then they're not done. So these are types of imperfective, if we want to be sort of lumpers of different types of aspects into big macro category aspects, 
or if we want to be splitters of aspects into like, these are some different kinds of imperfective aspect. And there are also different types of perfective and bad news, Gretchen. <laughs> the one we're going to talk about is called the perfect. Oh, no, don't do this to me. We have the perfect, which is a type of perfective. I, I don't like this. I think it's fair to say at this point in the episode that aspect – I think sometimes suffers from a bit of a branding problem. Mm. A lot of the categories, as we've seen, sometimes like continuous or habitual, you're like, sweet, perfect, does what it says. Sweet, perfect. <laughs> yes. They're not, not perfect, perfect because the perfect is perfect. Like there's occasionally a bit of a labeling hurdle to get over when it comes to reading or talking about aspect. Yeah. And the perfect is a sort of fun and useful aspect that, that you've already used, in fact, at the beginning of this episode. Do you remember what you said? Yes, this is the example I said that we didn't discuss, which is I had already embroidered the IPA when we started this podcast. So here we have had already embroidered, which is an event that happened in the past mm -hmm. before another event that also happened in the past. Mm -hmm. We started this podcast, you had already embroidered the IPA. Yeah. And so this like double extra perfective it's a completed event before another completed event. <laughs> it's perfect. It's so complete. It is like the most complete ever. Yes. <laughs> Aspect and its labels. And the thing I like about the perfect is that you can do it in all the tenses. Yeah. So you can say, I had already embroidered the IPA when we started this podcast. Yeah. Or I have already embroidered the IPA and now we're starting this podcast. Yes. <laughs> or I will have already embroidered the IPA when we will start this podcast, which makes a little bit less sense, but you could construct a version that makes sense, I promise. Yes. So the perfect really emphasizes the completed nature of the event. So – I've encountered the perfect in learning French and German and Italian and Spanish, which makes me feel like mm -hmm. this is the super common, typical aspect. But maybe I just have a biased sample. Because <laughs> those languages are all from the same area of the world. Oh, you absolutely have a biased sample. <laughs> Especially the perfect using the like a have verb is a common feature specifically to the language of Western Europe. So I'm looking at this map from the World Atlas of Linguistic Structures, and it really is just this tiny cluster in Western Europe. That's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> this is why you need a good, broad sample of languages when you're saying anything about what is common and uncommon in grammar, particularly in terms of aspect. And there are actually more languages around the world that use a word related to Finnish or already to make the perfect, which mm -hmm. makes total sense. But like, I don't speak any of those languages. <laughs> And of course, if you have a language that doesn't have a perfect or any kind of perfective imperfective distinction, which is just over half, as we talked about before, mm -hmm. using a word like finish or already is how you would indicate that events are completed. As usual, if you don't have the grammar to distinguish something, you usually use words that are equivalent to do that. Right. So you could say something like, I finished embroidering, I hike every day. And like you can come up with these somewhat complicated Latinate names for a bunch of different aspects, which is not really the point of this episode of like listing all of the Latinate names. Like mm -hmm. you could look at those on Wikipedia if you like. But this is about re recognizing and appreciating what makes an aspect an aspect, which is about the shape of time. And it really varies depending on the language, the grammatical features it has, the analysis that you do as to what kinds of categories it has. And I always feel like Appreciating the aspect structures of different languages is a bit like bird spotting. Mm. Like it's okay to have a guide. Yeah, like you take a little booklet or a little app or something when you're going bird watching because you have the general idea of how to spot birds, but not necessarily every single bird memorized. Yeah. And you might need to figure out if something is tense or aspect, and you don't always have to keep those categories in your head. Or even mood, which is a whole other category of verb marking. Oh, yeah. Which we've talked about in other episodes. We talked about it in our imperatives episode. Mood is less about time and more about something being real or hypothetical or its sort of ontological status rather than its time status. Mm -hmm. Especially because tense and aspect are both timey wimey, to use a technical linguistic term. I'm pretty sure that's the technical term for it. And mood and tense sometimes get this sort of glamorous position, mm -hmm. being people think about 
first maybe aspect is this like neglected middle sibling. But they're all stuff that verbs do and to make it more complicated, fun. I'm going to say fun. To make it all more fun, they all interact with each other. <laughs> We literally talk about them in linguistics as tense, aspect, and mood. So aspect is the literal middle child here. The analogy fits well. Yep. Tense, aspect, mood, or TAM. Any language, even a language that has tons of different grammaticalized aspects, this paper I was reading about ASL had uh, like 11 different grammaticalized aspects mentioned, but it depends on how much you sort of lump or split when you're trying to figure out this analysis. Hmm. And no language is going to grammaticalize absolutely every type of repetition or duration. Yeah, there's definitely an upper ceiling to how much you can grammaticalize. Right. So you might have something like, you know, regularly uh, or frequently, but you're unlikely to have a language that has specifically like a Tuesday-ative aspect to mean I do this on Tuesdays only. It's something you do habitually, but only on a Tuesday. <laughs> I think... You know, it's very important that Lingthusiasm is a Thursditative podcast. We like to be consistent, but I don't think we need a grammatical category just for Thursdays. Just for our posting schedule? Hmm. <laughs> but having said that, there are so many really great categories of aspect. Maybe I've got my favorite. Do you want to talk about our favorite categories of aspect? Absolutely. What's your favorite aspect, Lauren? Since we've already talked about the perfective imperfective distinction where you're really focused on the end of an event. I just want to give a shout out to the category of aspect where you focus on the start of something. Ooh. So that's the inchoative. A name that really has no other cognates in English and I find very difficult to remember, but it's a cool aspect. It's a cool aspect. The reason probably that it's like a category with its own cool name is that it's an aspect that's in Latin. Mm. So people in the grammatical tradition that a lot of our grammatical tradition is based on had this as a category. But it's the distinction between florere, which is to flower, and florescere, which is to start flowering. Oh, like a fluorescent light flowers? <laughs> um, fluorescence in terms of like the abundance of flowers is that starting to flower. And I think I also just love this because I always find this example so – wonderful, that like beginning to burst forth with flowers, really capturing that part of the event in terms of the flowering of spring. That's very delightful. My favorite aspect mm -hmm. is the frequentative, Ooh. which is a single action that's sort of repeated uh, over and over again, often within a fairly small time or something. Okay, And the frequentative is in Finnish, mm -hmm. where it's translated sometimes as like to do X, to run around the place or to run around or to like write around aimlessly. Okay. I do. It's something very charming about the kind of aimlessness of it that comes with this particular aspect. Yeah. So it's not, this one isn't, isn't only, do, like this one is specifically doing it aimlessly. There are other ways of just frequently doing something or there's like to sit to sit randomly somewhere, to loiter, to loiter around by sitting. Okay. That they use this frequentative suffix on there, which I think is really delightful. And the other cool thing about the frequentative, mm -hmm. and like in some cases, English can do a frequentative just by using like a different word, like to stand ver or sit versus to loiter. Yeah. Or to like to walk versus to wander. But English also has a relic of an actual frequentative hidden inside a bunch of common words. Oh, I love – the only thing I love more than morphology is relics of morphology. <laughs> is hidden secret morphology. Hidden secret old morphology. Mm -hmm. So the English suffix le uh -huh. um, in many words used to be a frequentative. So if you have like crack – Oh. Versus crackle. Yeah, it's like crackle. You don't just have one crackle. Yeah. It's like crackle, crackle, crackle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or curd versus curdle. Oh, again, like lots of little things. Yeah. Sniff versus sniffle. Right. Wag versus waggle. Ah. And I had to look this up to make sure it was really legit because there's been some vowel changes. But nose versus nuzzle is a frequentative. Oh, because you go mur, 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 when you nuzzle something. <laughs> Nuzzle something. Isn't that nice? Very hard to show an action on a podcast. <laughs> if only we had some aspect verbs to do that with. 
<laughs> the only thing about the the magical little old le suffix in English is there are actually like several old English l suffixes, so not all words do it. So some of the connections are sort of seem like they're the case in the modern English, but they're not. There's also an le that means a tool or an appliance, mm -hmm. which is the one that's in things like thimble and handle and spindle and stuff like that. That's completely different. That one's not the frequentative. That's it's a tool. And there's another one that's just diminutive. That's a smaller version of something. So again, not hashtag not all le's. Right. But the good news is that there's another frequentative suffix, which is also sometimes used. <laughs> More. Which is an ER. Again, lots of other uses for ER. But you do get things like float and flutter or pat and patter. Which are, you know, flutter is a more frequentative way of floating. Cute. And right there in front of me this whole time. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's so fun. Oh, just a nice example of why looking up etymologies sometimes leads you to the most delightful things. Even though sometimes it leads us to realizing that it's not always the frequentative. <laughs> Alas. <laughs> <laughs> if you were embroidering events, mm-hmm verbs rather than the international phonetic alphabet that we could metaphorically think of the tense part as like where on the fabric of time you're making the stitch mm -hmm. and then the aspect could be like what shape of stitch hmm. we're making like is it a cross stitch or a knot on a single point or like this big satin stitch covering a large area Oh, maybe mood is like the color of the thread we're using. I think we found a new craft project for someone, but it might take longer than a single weekend. Oh, then we could really say language is a rich tapestry. Absolutely. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on all of the podcast platforms or on lingthusiasm.com. You can get transcripts of every episode on lingthusiasm.com slash transcripts, and you can follow at Lingthusiasm on all the social media sites. You can get scarves with lots of linguistics patterns on them, including the International Phonetic Alphabet, branching tree diagrams, booba and kiki, and our favorite esoteric Unicode symbols, plus other Lingthusiasm merch, like our Etymology Isn't Destiny t-shirts and aesthetic IPA posters, at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. Links to my social media can be found at GretchenMcCulloch.com, my blog is allthingslinguistic.com, and my book about internet language is called Because Internet. My social media and blog is Superlinguo. Lingthusiasm is able to keep existing thanks to the support of our patrons. If you want to get an extra Lingthusiasm episode to listen to every month, our entire archive of bonus episodes to listen to right now, or if you just want to help keep the show running ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm or follow the links from our website. Patrons can also get access to our Discord chat room to talk with other linguistics fans and be the first to find out about new merch and other announcements. Recent bonus topics include comparatives and superlatives, linguistic mishearings with spoonerisms, mondegreens, and eggcorns, and secret codes and the word puzzles we create based on them. If you can't afford to pledge, that's okay too. We really appreciate it if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone in your life who's curious about language. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gaughan. Our senior producer is Claire Gon. Our editorial producer is Sarah Dapirella. Our production assistant is Marcet Tsutsui Billens. And our editorial assistant is John Crook. Our music is Ancient City by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic. Lingthusiastic.